I'm going to introduce uh, my friend and colleague, Mr. Eddie Pickle, for the next presentation. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, thank you. That's a great intro to um, our panel, International Efforts at Mapping the Globe. Uh, as Josh mentioned, my name is Eddie Pickle, and uh, on the panel, we've got representatives of private, non-governmental entities that are mapping the globe and playing an important role in what I think of as a civic engagement ecosystem or commons, as Josh was also talking about. We're all looking for ground truth, and that ground truth can set us free to make more and better informed decisions for the planet, for planet Earth. Now, joining me on the panel are uh, Ms. Amy Kokenauer Betancourt, who's the Chief Executive Officer of Cadasta Foundation, Mr. Alexander Tate, who's the geographer at the National Geographic Society, Dr. Patricia Solis, who's Executive Director of the Knowledge Exchange for Resilience at Arizona State University. I want to just give you a, re I want to give you a very quick rundown um, and a little bit of uh, imagery to back up some of the things that Josh was saying. I represent MaxR Technology. Uh, many of you might know us from the companies that made up MaxR, MDA, Digital Globe, Radiant Blue, and Human Geo. We are the people behind those high-resolution satellite imagery seen often in the media as the ground truth in disasters, conflicts, landscape, or urban change. We call that work Earth Intelligence. And I want to just talk about some of our work that illustrates the themes of this conference and the vital trends that reshape borders in a borderless world. Um, nowhere is that clearer than the geopolitical, you know, we talk about how is the geopolitical landscape being reshaped. Well, we can see it in near real time. For example, here's what's going on with Chinese island building and territorial expansion, here shown by satellite imagery on the expansion of Fiery Cross Reef, a Chinese occupied outpost in the Spratly Islands in the South China Sea. We also do a lot of work advancing remote sensing and geospatial technology. Uh, Josh was talking about machine learning. This is, we are changing how we map the world, another key theme here, to help us understand and quantify how landscapes are changing. And these images illustrate um, our work automating the identification and mapping of building footprints directly from satellite imagery. We can also, uh, we also advance how we change the world, uh, uh, map the world, and how we map boundaries and coastlines. We automatically can detect uh, through remote sensing um, coastline change in response to typhoons, rising seas, or erosion. Or here we can see how high-resolution imagery technology combined with expert analysis helps show us what is happening at borders, another theme. For example, analysis and imagery shows that despite the official closure of the Morocco-Algeria border in 1994, there are many points of entry that remained operational and several others that are not but are used illicitly. Or you can see what happens when borders close. For here, for example, is an image from Kobani, uh, Syria in October of 2014, showing what happened at the height of the migrant crisis in Europe when Turkey put in border checkpoints. Uh, this is when people were washing up on boats, et cetera. The border closed, and look at the queue starting right here. Picture is worth a thousand words. Or as climate change, Maxar is helping government customers understand how internet, the international movement of goods and money will change by 2050. Here we can see Russian shipping from newly opened oil and gas fields in Siberia in the rapidly warming uh, Arctic. And finally, Maxar Earth intelligence capabilities are used frequently in the press, you probably uh, see in, in the last few days. But here's a good example from um, us, uh, of our work helping uh, NGOs and the press understand challenges at the level above the nation state, uh, or the sovereign state. Maxar satellite imagery was used by investigative reporters in 2015 to catch illegal, unreported, and unre unregulated, or IUU, fishing in the act. Uh, this 30 centimeter resolution image from our Worldview 3 satellite gave the Associated Press indisputable, indisputable evidence of both IUU fishing and of human trafficking by locating and identifying um, enslaved people uh, on uh, the fishing, uh, fishing vessels staffed or, you know, employing uh, enslaved laborers. More than 2,000 men from Myanmar, Thailand, Cambodia, and Laos had been identified or repatriated since AP ran this initial story. Anyway, I just wanted to give you a, a little bit of an overview of some of the work that we are contributing to this global commons of um, uh, knowledge that uh, Josh was referring to. And I'm going to turn it over to Amy Kokenauer now to uh, talk to us about Cadastra's work. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, full disclosure, I am not a geographer. Um, but I think you have a new recruit in me. 
Um, and I was really excited to see the teachers. I texted my 15-year-old and said, does your school have, a, <laughs> have an AP Human Geography course? You need to check into it. So I've been really excited to learn and be here. Um, I'm actually an international development practitioner. I've been working for over 25 years in international development programming. Uh, for social and economic empowerment of vulnerable people around the world. And um, I ha it has been my pleasure over the last year and a half to be the CEO of Cadasta Foundation. Yesterday, uh, Alexander Diener said in his presentation, borders are elemental to placemaking. And I was thinking about that. And in our work, it's not borders that are elemental to placemaking, but boundaries and rights and uh, home. You know, the sense of home and place as identity, of land as identity, and what that means uh, in our world when we look at borders and, and, and boundaries. Uh, what does it mean in a world where 70% of the world's population, 70% do not have a legal a legally registered piece of land or title to their land. That's staggering. Only 30% of people in the world actually hold a title to their land. So, um, Cadasta Foundation is a nonprofit organization. We were founded in 2015 to advance land and resource rights and tenure security for vulnerable communities around the world using innovative technology and services. Our vision as an organization is to build a world where even the most marginalized individuals and communities can benefit from the opportunities afforded by secure land and tenure rights. So the question is, why land rights? First of all, let's talk about tenure. Tenure is the status of people's relationship to land, to property. So tenure security is the right to effective protection by government against forcible evictions. And there was a recent study last year, globally, that found out that one in four people feel insecure about their land tenure. And if you extrapolate, that's over 1.5 billion people globally. Um, and the, the point there is, whether or not someone has a title or a piece of paper, it, it, land tenure security is something that affects a, everything. It's, it's, uh, it affects, for example, whether people will invest in their land. It affects whether or not um, uh, people will access other resources like credit or have be able to access services and benefits. Um, there's a very clear linkage uh, between tenure security and a whole range of developmental outcomes. And the research bears that out. For example, um, with land tenure security, uh, parents who have secure rights to land are twice as likely to complete secondary school, for example. Or, for example, children whose mothers own land are 33% less likely to be severely underweight. So land and land tenure security is fundamental to a whole range of development outcomes and also fundamental to the sustainable development goals. If we don't deal with the issues around land and land tenure security, we will not reach, we will not attain the sustainable development goals. There are 14 of the sustain, out of the 17 sustainable development goals have some linkage to land or resource issues, whether it be water, whether it be uh, Gender, gender equality, uh, act, life on land, for example, food security, nutrition, et cetera. So this is a very fundamental issue. So why hasn't more been done? If we know these links are so important and we know that the land is fundamental to sustainable development outcomes, why hasn't more been done to make sure that more than 30% of people hold title to, title to their land? And the reason for that is complicated, but the short answer is, it is a government good that has fundamentally failed. Government land administration systems are not working for most people. Why? Because they have obsolete and outdated land administration systems. There's a lack of technology and human resources, corruption, bureaucracy, the cost. Um, 
And fundamentally, one of the biggest issues is lack of updated local data. They simply don't have the data at the local level for all these informal settlements, for people on the move, for people who, for communities that have sprung up, or even the communities that have been there for decades. There's never been uh, the resources to map those communities. So it is a huge global problem, and it's hindering development around the world. So the question is, what can we do about it? And what are we doing about it? Um, on the lack of data piece, Cadasta Foundation focuses on local data collection to support and advance land tenure security. So it is a, we are a digital platform using mobile, uh, mobile tools like smartphones and tablets to collect not only geospatial information around parcels, community demarcation of land, but also uh, survey level, household level data that links uh, people and information about people to the land that they live on. So our platform is designed to be used across geographies, across sectors and use cases to map and document parcels and the attributes of people who live on them. And the focus is to advance land tenure and land and resource rights. So to understand our work, you need uh, also to uh, look at all the different kind of technologies that we're able to access, of course, geospatial imagery. Uh, drone, drone imagery, cloud computing, et cetera. So there's a wide range of technologies that we can bring in to make this happen, even in the most vulnerable communities. Also to understand what we're doing, it's not always just about formal land rights with a formal freehold title on the right-hand side. There are other mechanisms like customary rights, where there's a, 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 a customary authority that can allocate land, uh, also occupancy certificates or production certificates. So what Cadasta tries to do is figure out in any given context, how do we advance people along this spectrum, along this continuum, to continually push and advance uh, land tenure security and rights. So how does that work? The first thing we do is I identify partners on the ground working with vulnerable communities, trusted intermediaries, trusted entities, including communities themselves. We determine needs, opportunities, what their outcomes and objectives are. Do they want to formalize their land? Do they want to just increase access to public benefits? Do they want to um, improve uh, other kinds of developmental outcomes? Next, what we do is we identify technology solutions. Uh, drawing on what, need, what their needs are for accuracy, for the use of the data, um, what the government needs to issue documentation. And also we engage in participatory processes with the community. We train our partners on land, technology, uh, how to use the data, and then we train data collectors. And then finally, we provide technical support during data collection. We don't do the data collection, our partners do. They know their land and their communities best. They own their own data, they need to own and manage their data. And then we can also work to transfer data into government systems uh, where then uh, land documents can be issued. We still can't formally legalize anything. That is still the government's purview. We're just pushing from the bottom up. And then we can also evaluate impact. So our progress to date, we have more than 1.7 million people on our platform. We have mapped over 1.2 million hectares, or our partners have, in 17 countries with 46 partners working in 815 communities uh, with 16 government entities. And we've issued over 71,000 land documents. So that just gives you an idea. What gaps does Cadasta help close or fill? The data gap getting data from the ground up to push up into government systems to, to formalize people at scale. A capacity gap, capacity around how do you use data, how do you collect it, how do you interpret it, how do you visualize it, manage it, report about it, and use it for advocacy. Gaps around technology, of course. We're giving out uh, open, we're giving out the technology at no cost. Um, and uh, helping support, help speed up uh, and drive down the cost and scale up mapping. And then finally, advocacy, uh, supporting the advocacy gap. 
You can't push for certain things when there's no data. You can't go to a government entity and say, we, have, we, we, we don't have any water. There's no, we, we need to show data. We need to show them where, it, where it's needed. Finally, what connections do we want to make as an organization? We want to drive systems level change to help millions of people feel more secure about their land and to secure their land tenure so that they can live and work better, decrease conflict, and avoid the need to migrate. What do we seek? We want concrete mechanisms to support the sustainable development goals from the bottom up. We want strategic partnerships with donors, implementers, and other stakeholders to build a global pl platform for land and property rights. Please come talk to me if you're interested in partnering. I'd love to chat with you all and connect with you about collaboration. Thank you. Alex. I'd like to uh, thank Dr. Wesley Reiser and the AGS Council for inviting me here to be on this panel and to thank Eddie for organizing it for us. Uh, I am a geographer. I am the geographer at the National Geographic Society. Actually, there's quite a few geographers at National Geographic, but I'm the only one with the in my title, like my friend Lee Schwartz at the US State Department. And like Lee, I am uh, responsible for managing map policy at National Geographic, how we display political borders on our maps, but I'm also uh, in a position to provide geographic and mapping expertise across National Geographic Society's programs, and I work with the education group. And so I want to talk more about that. As much as I love talking about how we put uh, political boundaries on maps, and nowhere else would I have a chance to talk with as many people that know de jure, de facto boundaries and the differences and the ability to uh, sort through those. I want to talk about how our other work relates to boundaries, uh, relates to borders, and in many ways, what we focus on in our geography are issues that are borderless. So I came up here and uh, I was telling people back in Washington that I was uh, going to be participating in a symposium that this other geographic society was putting on. And I realized that now I'm here in this space, National Geographic is the other geographical society. Um, and what do we do? You heard from Kate, my colleague, Caitlin Yarnall, this morning. Um, and she was talking about storytelling, which is an essential part of what we do. Our mission is about science, exploration, education, and storytelling to illuminate and protect our world. We take very seriously our ability to focus attention on some of the classic geographical questions that are challenging us in this time of global change. So we are supporting scientists, we are supporting people that are going out, exploring, bringing attention to things, uh, and education. We have a very strong education uh, department. Um, it's focused on K-12. We even have an AP Human Geography text that's gonna be coming out under the National Geographic brand, so a definite shout out to all the teachers here. We work very closely with the education community in promoting geography as a field of study in K-12 education that goes beyond what I call, not disparagingly, Jeopardy geography. That geography is important, but we need to promote geography beyond knowing places uh, in the world. So National Geographic has always had a very broad purview of geography. Uh, I love the quote from Pierce Lewis, who was a historical geographer that I was able to work with. Uh, he worked at Penn State University. And he says that geography is the only discipline that asks you to look at the whole world and try to make sense of it. Um, it's really broad, uh, and it's a real challenge. It's both sort of the promise and the curse of geography in my mind. Um, in 2013, National Geographic sponsored a journalist to trace the path of humans uh, coming out of Africa and spreading across the world, human origins. This is Paul Solopec, and this is in um, the Arabian Peninsula, Peninsula, which was part of his journey. He's traveled already 11,000 miles in his journey across Africa and Asia. Eventually, he's going to go across um, at Siberia and Alaska and down through the Americas. He's been, to fit, he's been across 50 borders, and he's been stopped 100 times by police. 
There's a great map story uh, that you can connect to off the National Geographic website that describes this experience for him. So it's about journalism across borders. It's about being able to tell stories about people he meets along the way. Um, and it's an incredible opportunity for us to focus attention on journalism and on storytelling from across the world through Paul Salopek's journey. So many of you know this side of National Geographic. This is our media side. Uh, and it's really important. The, the broad reach of National Geographic's brand crosses borders. It's completely international. It crosses another kind of political border in that National Geographic reaches across the political spectrum from right to left. We are a voice that gets listened to um, across the political spectrum, which gives us an opportunity. We are partnering with Disney now on the media side. Caitlin and I work on the nonprofit side. And I want to move beyond this, as important as that is, and as important a, a megaphone it gives us, I want to talk about some of our programs and how the programs and the focus we can bring to issues reaches across borders. We have a grants program. As you can see, we have grantees, over 3,000 in the last 10 years, that work across the world. An ever-increasing percentage of them are from not Europe, not North America, but Africa, South America, Asia, uh, and parts of the world that need more people doing research. And as I said, we focus on specific topics. In this case, it's the topic of plastic pollution. And these are cross-cutting issues at the juncture of the human environment and the natural world. And we're able to work with scientists, produce media materials such as this map that was in National Geographic magazine. But in addition to that, we're able to fund expeditions that help focus on these issues. We have an all-woman expedition that's going to the Ganges River one of the most important uh, sources of plastic. You can see the cone for the Ganges over there with plastic going into the oceans. Um, and Jenna Jembeck is leading this expedition to look at the sources of pollution of plastics in the Ganges River system. It's cross-boundary. Of course, the Ganges system includes Bangladesh, India, China, some of the most important countries in South Asia for trying to work towards solutions to some of these problems. I was fortunate to work on this program. It's called Life at the Extremes. It's looking at climate change across biomes in different parts of the world. And for high mountains, we were looking at the concept of water towers and the water resources that are locked into the cryosphere of high mountain Asia in particular. And these are critical issues cutting across boundaries, but encountering boundaries and borders when you're trying to reach solutions. So we were very fortunate to work with a research institute called ISIMOD that's made up of all the countries in high mountain Asia. And I think there's real promise in some of these international organizations, which we heard about earlier, to reach towards solutions for some of these borderless problems. Our pristine seas team works in the oceans, helping to establish protected areas. And one of the things we're able to do through sending expeditions to some of these areas is to bring a spotlight, provide a means to tell stories about these areas that need to be protected, and then work with governments to be able to establish protected areas or to bring attention to problems. So our team was able to work with the UK government. They recently established a marine protected area around Ascension Island in the Atlantic. And it's also the possibility of international. So the high seas, working beyond sovereign limits, the Ross Sea Marine Protected Area off of Antarctica is involved all the major powers, the United States, China, Russia, and other Antarctic uh, countries, countries with an interest in Antarctica like Chile, Argentina, Australia, New Zealand, all signed on to the protected area there. And we're working towards providing information and tools, a new, a new way of mapping the world beyond an atlas of the world or a static map. And this means of taking continually updated data and then relating it to something like, in this case, the Rothschild giraffe range from the IUCN. How does it overlap protected areas? What other factors, such as population, are going to impact this range? And you can probably already see that some of the range, and it's a it's all over East Africa. Some of those ranges 
are not within protected areas. They may not really contain giraffes anymore. So this gives you some idea of what we're working on, uh, providing a platform for bringing focus to issues, generally international issues, because you're talking about water resources, you're talking about animal migration. I, we could have, I could have been in the, the previous se session about the natural world. That's a very keen focus for National Geographic. And we need to look towards the future of a healthy planet. So this is a picture from southern Africa. The previous picture was Steve Boy's expedition in the Okavango Delta. He's working to establish additional protected areas in the entire Okavango uh, uh, River Basin. And as we look towards solutions for a healthy planet for the future, I realized in preparing my uh, remarks and in listening to people, so many of the critical issues we're facing are borderless. But as we reach towards solutions to them, we encounter borders, and we need to work with international organizations. These issues are so pressing that we can't wait until borders are resolved. We need to work with the structure we have now and start making changes. Thank you. Good afternoon. Wow, 2050. Think about that for a second. I was thinking about it this morning. And um, so the generation that will be my age up here speaking to you at the 2050 conference right now uh, is just entering college or just entering the workforce. That's the so-called Generation Z, right? They're the most connected generation that we've ever had for humanity despite the digital divide. And I'm wondering, could they maybe be our very first truly borderless generation? The expectations that they have for their work lives, wherever they are in the world, is that they will be a part of a global workforce, inside of it or outside of it, um, that they will live in a globalized society. So I wonder, how will they define their world in their own terms? There's been a lot of youth movements that have expired, inspired us, and Youth Mappers is our answer from the academic community to how can we help make this happen? How will we help them define their world? We think by mapping it. So in 2014, you saw we came up with the concept. 2015, we started and launched this program. There are now 175 Youth Mappers chapters. Uh, and on campuses in 45 countries around the world. That's about 5,000 mappers who are doing this. They are going onto OpenStreetMap and working on remote humanitarian mapping campaigns or also working on their own local projects for needs and local development needs that they themselves define as being important. We're using satellite imagery, all the latest technology, uh, giving access, giving training, um, we have faculty mentors that help them do this, but this is youth-led chapters and groups on campuses uh, all around the world. So the kinds of work that they do might take them for mapping for USAID, flooding, uh, mapping buildings uh, for the Red Cross and after Hurricane Maria, um, working uh, to uh, map in Africa for malaria, for PEPFAR, uh, or working in Nigeria on a student-led project to map waste uh, in their own local community. Our chapters, as you can see, are very active. Uh, I'm really happy to actually debut this dashboard. Shout out to Jennings Anderson for doing this. What we're trying to also do is make their work visible. We don't want them just to be seen as the labor force behind building the maps, but they have a really important process of building our understanding about what is happening. And building, not only making them visible to us and visible within these projects, but visible to each other as they build those networks and the solidarity that they need to define their world by mapping it. So um, this visualization shows you where since the beginning of Youth Mappers to date, uh, Youth Mappers have actually mapped around the world um, responding to these uh, campaigns that we maybe have led or their own individual mapping. You can see that they've done a tremendous, a tremendous job. 
But I like to say, we don't just build the map, we build mappers. And it's those connections that the students can create with each other through working on projects collaboratively. So for example, after Hurricane Maria, which I mentioned to you, we had students from Kenya, from Uganda, from Bangladesh, from Texas, all mapping together. We have a chapter in Puerto Rico, but they couldn't map because they didn't have electricity. So we all mapped with them in solidarity and sent messages and really started to understand what was happening in this place. Uh, who, are, who are my peers that are there? What is going on? And what does this mean? Um, we're really particularly proud of uh, one of our original chapters. Uh, we've, we were founded at Texas Tech University, West Virginia University, and the George Washington University, and now housed at Arizona State University where I'm at. Uh, but our very first chapter outside of the United States was in Cape Coast, Ghana, the University of Cape Coast. And they have uh, been a, a big force, not only for their local mapping, these big campaigns, including uh, disasters and humanitarian work, but for a project that we call Let Girls Map. We're very concerned that it's an inclusive kind of mapping. Uh, about 40% of our students are female mappers, and so we really promote that within our work, and about a third of our chapters have majority female members in their chapters. And in Ghana, where you see here, uh, all of the data popping up uh, was in large part with their campaign, the Let Girls Map campaign. That inspired uh, a chapter in Rwanda to issue their own local campaign called Help My Sister to Map. And in Dhaka, we have an all-male university that is helping uh, a local girls' school learn how to map. But I think every change, every little change on this map helps all of us to change our minds about what young people can do. Um, what they can do not only on their own, but we need to create that space for them. We want to create uh, the platforms and, and move in that space um, to accommodate them. Um, they are leaders. Uh, you heard earlier today, I applaud national, uh, the UN Foundation for their work with youth. I agree, they're not leaders tomorrow. We have to make sure that they have that space to exercise that today. And they have names. Uh, they should be up here instead of me. I have this privilege, so I will go ahead and show you who they are. Names like Maliha, Maria Fernanda, Kwame, uh, Bruce in Indonesia, Laura in Kenya. These are our regional ambassadors. We support them through internships, leadership fellows, and re research fellowships through the Youth Mappers program. So what can we learn from them? What can they teach us? There's one message that I want to leave with you with. Um, I tried to do a little bit experiment because I really wanted to know, is this really true? What, it, what could it be, knowing this purpose of mapping and connecting? So I experimented with my students in Texas. I gave, sorted them into two groups. They were brand new mappers. Half of them, I didn't really tell them why they were mapping. I just taught them the technology, how to trace an open street map. The other one, I told them all about youth mappers. I told them about the group in Ghana, uh, the food security issue with USAID that we were working on. and then tested them before and after mapping for performance. They took surveys to really try to understand what they were thinking. Um, so after only 30 minutes of tracing the building footprints, they were more likely to say that technology as a whole benefits society after helping to build that map. They were also changed their ideas about the importance of being a global citizen and giving back after building the map, increasing that. And they also became less interested, less negative about how do other people feel. So could humanitarian mapping be a place to start to learn empathy? Can we learn this from the next generation? Can we use the map to connect to each other, connect the next generation, and help them define the new world in a borderless society? Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, before we take uh, questions from the audience, I just want to ask one question to the panel. Um, so if anybody is, uh, has a question for us, just come on up to the mic, and while you're doing that, I'll just ask. Um, I think each of you did a great job of, of infusing meaning into your um, presentation, but if you wouldn't mind, could you amplify what you think your work 
and the work of your organization means. How does it affect nations, borders, or movement across borders? And I'll start with Amy. Well, as we were talking about, we've been talking about refugees all these, the whole time these last uh, couple of days. And um, if we look at the seeds of conflict in those areas, a lot of it has to do with land. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, in some countries, you, there are statistics, something like, you know, 70% of the uh, court cases that are active in the country have to do with land conflict. So being able to provide clarity, transparency, um, data, participation, and ownership of, around data and land rights and resource rights is critical in some cases to avoiding the kind of conflict and migration that we're seeing driving. And I know that's kind of simplistic. There's a lot of other very complex <clears throat> geopolitical and social and economic factors there. But, uh, but land is a really critical piece of that. So um, when we talk about borders and we talk about boundaries and talk about borderless society and, and how things cross borders, we, we still can't lose that fundamental essence of place, of mm -hmm. home, of, <coughs> of, of, of belonging. And particularly, we look at indigenous peoples. We saw the presentation yesterday about indigenous people. Indigenous people, for them, land is not about property. It's not about ownership. It's about a life. It's about livelihood. It's about, uh, it's about tradition and history and sacred places. And so being able to demarcate that land uh, find mechanisms, the formal mechanisms for recognition of those lands is critical, not only for the, uh, their long-term sustainability as people, but also for conservation, for uh, environmental sustainability and all and protection of resources. So um, this issue around land and protecting and, and recognizing land and resource rights is absolutely fundamental when we talk about borders and boundaries and nation states and peoples. It's, it's just at the very heart of it. Thanks. Alex? Um, yeah. Uh, I'd like to point to the, the work to illuminate the idea of bringing attention to an issue. Um, we're looking at some of the most pressing global issues, like water resources, like animal migrations, um, the health, these, these all relate, a lot of these relate directly to the SDGs, the health of the natural world on land and in the oceans, and how powerful storytelling and connecting people to an issue through telling stories from the local people, as Caitlin did with the refugees, through working with local scientists and others in the region, like we did uh, in the Kumbu region of Nepal, working with scientists on both sides of that border, and these stories, as Samantha Powers said about her work with this small problem of just 20 people, 20 women in prison, telling their story, diving into their stories gives you the power to bring it to a wider audience. And I think the wider audience is across nations, it's international, and it can get the attention to ideally spark action. It's, of course, just the first step to action. Thanks. Patricia? Yes, I think in addition, like Amy said, to connecting people to place, um, and like Alex said, connecting people to the issues, and um, like I'm trying to also get across connecting people to each other. I think that this is what we can do with these kinds of uh, maps we, when we see it more than just putting data in these certain locations. Um, and I, I, if, if you would indulge me at just a, a short little story about how powerful this can be, um, when I was teaching at Texas, in Texas Tech, I had a student and I would assign them uh, a project in a certain location and I would have them connect with the chapter somewhere in that location to better understand the place and the issue and communicate with the, their peers. Um, this was West Texas and I don't think it's lost on anyone that there is a border on Texas. And um, this, this kid, I had a lot of respect for him. He's you know ranch kid, tall, big guy. and it's just taken a technology class, but he really dived into the project. And his project was mapping the Bidi Bidi camp in uh, northern Uganda from right at the time where the South Sudanese were really streaming over. The, the satellite imagery was changing almost daily about you know, where those camps were being put. And 
he mapped 80,000 edits in one semester. I mean, my students normally map 5,000 edits. He mapped 80,000 edits, and I'm like, I hope you pass the rest of your classes because yeah. he, he really, somehow, it spoke to him. And I, I like to think that that process was a way of, he, he never will probably travel to Africa, um, but the process of being a part of something where you can put, mark the place in the world, understand what's going on, connect through that, I think it's very powerful. No, oh, that's great. I do, I do want to add that Alex talked about illumination. One of the things that in putting this together, um, I was thinking about with Maxar, in, in illuminating with the high resolution imagery that we have, it's interesting, we are often finding problems that don't have a solution yet. For example, we see people, we see boats that are illegally fishing for countries that have no enforcement mechanism for it. So um, one of the things that I think all of us are doing is surfacing things that really nations need, to, we are the hands waving and calling out issues for countries to deal with. Um, are there questions from the audience? Hi, my name is Xing Hong, a PhD student in geography from Kent State University. I have a question for Amy. So are there areas your team wanted to introduce cadastral platform there and collect ground truth data from the bottom, but your team was not granted the access due to governmental or military restrictions? Um, the same question may also go to Dr. Solis. And are there any locations your team find, it, find them difficult to build the mapping collaborations and grow their mapping data in response to humanitarian disaster? Thank you. Thanks for your questions. Um, we only go into places and communities where we have a partner and we've been invited in to pro provide uh, our platform and training and, and, and assistance. Um, but because the local community groups and our local partners are the ones who are carrying out the mapping, um, there ha we, have not, we have not encountered anywhere where we weren't able to carry it out for whatever reason. I will say though, um, in Haiti, we were working in Haiti with Habitat for Humanity, and um, we are having issues because of violence there uh, that's preventing our, the teams from getting out in the field. Um, and then the only other point on that is we don't necessarily encounter um, uh, resistance or, or, or blockage of, of doing the data collection, but one of the big, big issues out there is where, what happens to the data after it's collected. It is a very, very sensitive issue. A lot of governments and, uh, you know, don't, uh, they're very adamant about uh, having that information go into a government system and not go sit, you know, somewhere else in a server in some other country. The Cadasta platform is intended to be very secure uh, and a place where data can sit safely with full permissions and security uh, protocols around it. But so that is one issue is, is the issue around data. Uh, we come, it comes up a lot in how that data is being treated and what the data governance structure is. Thank you for your question too. Um, similarly, yes, we encounter lots of lots of challenges. I don't know where to start sometimes, but um, because we do a, a use OpenStreetMap a lot, that's not the only tool that we um, have our chapters use or provide training on. Um, there is also that sensitivity to how the data is going to be used. And we, we have had chapters ask us if they could, for example, map in a refugee camp, and we have not identified another, an, a humanitarian user, end user, and we just basically said that is not a good project if you do not have the end user because it can expose vulnerable people. It becomes a really great lesson um, to, to share around the ethics of the data. There are places, of course, in the world where students are not allowed legally to map, and um, we've not been able to form chapters there. For example, in Pakistan, they, they cannot map on OpenStreetMap in Pakistan, but they have jumped on to other mapping, remote mapping. Like, for example, in the Kathmandu earthquake in 2015, 
They could certainly map to other places of the world, just not locally. So there's ways that we try to accommodate participation because it is student-led and chapter-led. We provide a lot of advice about what kinds of challenges and roadblocks you might encounter and how to be very careful. Um, each one of our chapters is um, officially sanctioned by their university. They have to provide their bylaws so that they do have some institutional support and they have a faculty mentor. Um, there is the digital divide also that we still encounter. Of course, internet is a big challenge, but also by having that university infrastructure, ideally that um, gives them access to the lab or access to some of the resources that the universities might have as well. So we're trying to overcome some of those, not, not to say that it's not without its challenges, I think similar ones, um, but the, the students are pretty, they persevere in trying to find ways to contribute. Alex, I'm wondering if your, um, the, the journey from Africa outward it reveals area, or it's like one grand experiment in where I can get data or where I'm going to get in trouble or whatever. Yeah, Paul Salopek, his journey through Central Asia mm -hmm. and South Asia has been very interesting. There are areas he certainly needs to avoid, Kashmir being one of them, um, that he really simply couldn't transit through Kashmir, though he wanted to. Um, that was uh, last year. Um, and so that's the sort of story that helps illuminate where issues are. And in talking to people along the way, he's walking this entire journey. He meets people that he can then uh, get their experience of being in these areas, certainly near borders. Um, and what we're able to do, and I'll speak to give another shout out to the geography teachers, is that we're, be able, we're able to build uh, educational assets on this that are available through our website so that students can engage with somebody and he actually does reports directly to classrooms from the field as do many of our explorers. Fantastic. Well we have 30 seconds apiece and I'll just have one quick question. Do you expect uh, or where do you expect this to impact uh, national decision making or borders your work? Well, we're pushing for systems level change. We want to push national governments to speed up, to use technology to speed up and make more affordable and make more accessible land services for vulnerable people. Um, I'd say that these water towers, these areas in the high mountains, which are often at boundaries, are going to be one of the areas that are just going to be critical for uh, inter-country cooperation and and you know there are limited resources they need to be a, that agreement needs to be reached on how to use them thank you yeah well because we co-founded youth mappers with USAID mm -hmm. agency for international development and they remain a very active um, a partner in our work I think that that's definitely the the way that we're gonna have the biggest impact and we've actually even seen it some of our we've been just long enough to see some of our students graduate and some have even taken positions in USAID missions. And so building that capacity, not just the maps, but also the mappers, I think is where we're gonna really have the most impact. Okay, thank you. And I just, I, I'll just note that I think we're gonna be running into a lot of maritime issues ourselves mm -hmm. in the, some of the work that we do. Anyway, I wanna thank the panel. Thank all of you, Patricia, Alex, Amy. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you all, audience, and uh, we'll be around. If you had any questions, you wanna grab us at a break. <laughs>